Hey, lovely folks. Before we dive into today's epic tale, I've got some super exciting news for you. Guess what? I've started selling some seriously cool t-shirts and canvas prints. They're totally different and awesome, just like you all. So if you want to check them out, just hit up the link in the description below. Trust me, you don't want to miss this. All right, now let's get comfy and enjoy the story of the day together. As a sort of prelude to my near-death experience, at the time in my life, in January 1983, I was known as the drug dealer to the stars. I sold cocaine to several clients in the Hollywood film industry, as well as musicians, painters, restaurant owners, and others. I imagined myself to be a really cool and indispensable guy who was loved and admired by everyone. I had a source for pure cocaine smuggled in from Peru, and everyone was crazy about what I was selling. Life was great. After five years of a seamless operation, the guy smuggling in the cocaine flew down to Peru and did not return as expected. My clients were nearly in a state of panic. They relied on a steady supply of my cocaine to keep up with their demanding job schedules and lifestyles. I was under duress to find another source of cocaine or risk losing all of my clients. I phoned a female friend of mine who knew a guy who sold cocaine to several prominent rock musicians and set up a meeting with him. I traveled to his house in the hills behind Malibu Beach, talked with him, and agreed to buy a quarter pound of his cocaine as a sample to see if my clientele would like it. I snorted some lines of the product at his residence and realized it wasn't even close to the quality of my typical stuff. However, I felt compelled to have something to give my clients, at least until my smuggler guy got back in touch and I had a game plan for the future. Unfortunately for me, this was the start, the starting point of a marathon drug binge of enormous proportions. Only later did I discover that the cocaine I had purchased was a forgery. It was proparacaine, a synthetic numbing medication laced with methamphetamine. The thing just drove me insane. Nothing could stop me or knock me out to get me off the false drug. I was snorting line after line and drinking fifth after fifth of hard liquor. I began taking directly hands full of sedative pills, followed by hard booze to knock me asleep. But even that did not work. I just kept snorting the drug, growing more and crazier. I felt like I was attempting to kill myself, but I couldn't. After approximately four days of non-stop, no-sleep crazy, an artist friend of mine stopped over and asked me to get him an ounce of China white heroin from a source I knew. I know some Hare Krishna people who smuggled heroin from Thailand, and it was a great deal since no one expected obnoxious Hare Krishna guys to be drug smugglers. I'd never used or bought any of these things, but I knew them from back in the day in Laguna Beach, when they were surfers before becoming Hare Krishnas. I called the man I knew, and he said he had some stuff available. So we agreed to meet that evening on top of Mount Soledad in La Jolla, California. At the summit of Mount Soledad, which overlooks La Jolla, is a 27-foot-tall Christian cross. I went down to La Jolla from Laguna Beach in the dark on the San Diego freeway, and I was so high and insane that I was sliding side to side in the fast lane and bashing into the guardrail. Every time I hit the railing, sparks flew up. Finally, I arrived at La Jolla and drove up the winding road to Mount Soledad. There was just one car parked in the lot beneath a huge white cross, which was illuminated by spotlights, so I knew it had to be the Hare Krishna man. I parked my car and walked up to his car, motioning for me to get on the passenger side. I offered him $2,000 in exchange for a bag of white powder. I got out of the car and he drove away. I got into the car and decided to test a teeny tiny sniff of the white powder. I stuffed a matchbook cover corner inside the baggie and snorted just a little bit. Later, I discovered that the China White was actually fentanyl, a synthetic painkiller that is 100 times more strong than the same quality of heroin. This was China White heroin, and it was extremely strong and popular. But I wasn't a junkie, and I didn't have the tolerance for such a strong substance. I realized I was in big trouble right away. I had overdosed right there under the cross of Jesus. I started the car and drove out of the parking lot. The tall white cross metaphorically illuminated in my rearview mirror. It began to rain and the raindrops began to smoosh on the windshield like jelly. Everything was slowing down, including the windshield wipers which began to flap, flap, flap like limp celery stalks. 
I noticed someone hitchhiking on the side of the road. I pulled over and opened the passenger door, saying, Please help me. I had overdosed. I'm going to die. Instead of assisting me, the guy hopped into the car and began striking me in the face right away. Smashing, smashing, smashing. Right, left, left, right. I went black. So the next thing I know, I'm in this area I now refer to as the space station, but I didn't think of it that way when I became aware of my presence there. It was like a stunning hyper-real park of natural setting with vibrant flowering plants and magnificent trees, kind of like a Georges Seurat or Monet painting. There was a large park-like area with short grass, and I quickly realized that there were many people there that I knew or didn't know. There were family and friends from every stage of my life present. My sisters were present. My mother was there, and she was extremely young and lovely. And I realized how I had only ever seen her as a mother, rather than an individual with a life outside of being my mother. There were friends from all stages of my life, all about my age, around 20 years old or so, and everyone looked healthy and lovely. With youth and purity in our faces and words, we were all instantly the best of friends again. We trusted one another, and we were so comfortable and at ease with each other that it seemed like heaven. We felt like we'd be there for a long time. We seemed to have always been there and would always be there. Then I spotted impossibly tall windows on one side that were so clear that there didn't appear to be any form of glass as a barrier. I stepped over to the windows and saw the entire solar system rotating and swirling in three dimensions. Comets might be seen shooting through space, and I could see galaxies upon galaxies into the infinite. I understood I was at a crossroads between Earth and eternity. Then, on the other side of the park, I noticed an off-white wall that ran the entire unfathomable length of the park. I approached the wall. I spotted a door in the wall that was slightly ajar, a door that was slightly open. I gripped the door's edge with my fingernails and yanked it open. I immediately understood I was in a courtroom. It appeared to be from the Salem Witch Trials. My relatives and friends from all periods of my life were seated and standing behind me. A being seated next to me at a table was my guardian angel, but I intuitively understood he was also functioning as a defense attorney. A being sat on the table next to us, and I recognized him as some sort of prosecuting angel or prosecuting attorney. Seated in front of both tables were three entities that resembled severe, merciless Puritan elders, all clothed in black with white collars and black hats. They reminded me of Cotton Mather. I recognized them as the judges. I knew this was going to be a test for my moral soul's very survival. Behind the three judges was a door that appeared to be a doorway or a tunnel with a pulsating, alive light. And the living light told me telepathically in images to my head and feelings to my body that merging with it was the route to true heaven if I could just endure this ordeal. And I had a speed of light awareness that I was a kind of cell or bubble and a sea of cells or bubbles that were all individual self-worlds connected to each other that were all individual yet all one and all part of an ocean-like being that was the source of all existence. So I was me, they were it, and we are all one, all separate, yet one at the same time. The sensation or experience went well beyond any sex climate or drug high I've ever had. It was the genuine article. The magnificent orgasmic vision then vanished, and I was back on the table next to my counsel and the trial was ready to begin. The prosecuting attorney, Angel, began summoning my relatives and friends to the witness stand one by one. What used to be my friends and family were now testifying against my character and various evil activities throughout my life. My former pals each informed me how I had wounded, betrayed, and failed them in various ways. Over and over, one person after another, blah, blah, blah. My defense attorney, Angel, began leaping up and down and crying, Objection! hearsay, or anything. But the judges just kept saying overruled. I had a strong sense that this wasn't going to go my way. And sure enough, when the prosecuting angel presented his final witness against me, he turned to face the judges, who exchanged quick words before turning to face me and yelling, 
Dying is too good for you. You must return. I was looking up at a person who I quickly knew was a nurse. My nostrils were stuffed with tubes. I had tubes coming into and out of one wrist. A tube was inserted into my urinary tract. I was completely addicted to machines. And the nurse began to cry and smile, clearly joyful and emotional. Oh my God, she exclaimed. We got you back. She summoned the attention of other nurses and doctors, and the room quickly became crowded. The nurses and physicians took turns telling me that I was in Scripps Loyola Hospital's ICU, and that I'd been in a coma for three days. They said that I was found viciously beaten next to my car, and that the people who discovered me ran to a neighbor's house and had them contact the paramedics, who promptly began working to save my life. When I got at the hospital, it was clear that, in addition to being beaten, I had overdosed, so they began attempting to reverse the overdose. But I had so many different substances in me that the standard methods didn't work. They ended up conducting blood washing, which is a type of dialysis, to get the medications out of my system. Meanwhile, I kept collapsing and dying, and they kept bringing me back, all this incredible heroism to preserve my life. And the whole time, I was in other space, going through a type of trial for the fate of my mortal soul. When the physicians and nurses were eventually able to stabilize me, I was brought to the ICU recovery room, but they had little hope that I would be anything other than a vegetative coma until I died. So the doctors and nurses thought it was a miracle that I was returned from the brink of death. Apart from the bandaged up and smashed up face, I was ambulatory and lucid, and they were overjoyed as did I. So, there was one unexpected thing I discovered about the medications I'd been using. One of the nurses handed me a printout of the drug analysis of my blood, of my body. Instead of cocaine, there was only a synthetic numbing substance called propercaine. Methamphetamine was also present. And instead of heroin, there was fentanyl in my blood. A synthetic narcotic 100 times stronger than a comparable quantity of heroin. That, according to the nurse, is what nearly killed me. I was startled to learn that I had been sold counterfeit cocaine, which had launched my addiction. Then I was sold super potent fentanyl instead of regular heroin, which nearly killed me. So I wish I could say I learned a lesson from that experience right away, but I didn't. Later that day, in the recovery area, I called a female acquaintance and asked her to drive me from the hospital. I crept out of the recovery area and into the trunk of her car, making a dramatically dramatic escape from the hospital. However, a few days later, I had a courteous thank you note printed and framed, which I sent to the doctors and nurses who had saved my life. I also paid as much of my hospital costs as I could afford, which was $8,000. Next, I relocated from the opulent Los Angeles celebrity drug culture to another state. However, my Peruvian cocaine supplier returned and I ended up selling and consuming the drug for another nine years. Finally, in March 1992, I was set up by some of my clients who had been arrested and they let drug enforcement officials arrest me when I showed up to sell some goods to the clients. Following that, while spending 30 days in jail awaiting the summation of charges, I had some sort of self-realization and when I got out, I went through my legal trial got convicted, did only 90 days of work release, and quit drugs, and I've never used anything of that sort since then. 25 years. So, I'm grateful to be able to relate my tale in this forum because no one has ever believed or cared about what I've gone through, and I recall the full outer space event vividly and intensely. I am aware that there is always something more present that is greater than what most religions, with the exception of Buddhism and Hinduism, refer to as heaven. I was briefly one with it, and I know it is possible to be one with it again, this time for eternity.